saw Winnie meet Deputy Dewey. Winnie, it's a cat. Oh, oh no! <laughs> Sarah, I'll tell you right up top, you are kind of like a bucket list guest for Ladies Night. So I am very excited to have you on the show. Well, I'm Welcome. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. I'm especially glad to be doing this for Run because I think that set visit might have been the coldest one I've ever been on, <laughs> but also the most fulfilling in the end because when you get to see something through to the end like that, and especially beyond the set of a smaller production, mm -hmm. I feel like we don't get that experience often enough here. Yes, I think that's, I, I, the only thing I know about is that it was the coldest place I have ever been while pretending it was spring, you know? Yeah, I, I honestly can't even imagine how you did that. That's where it gets a little like the real, that's where they're really paying you the money for the acting. Like pretend you're warm, pretend you're well, warm. <laughs> you can't feel Job well done in that department. <laughs> All right. I warned you. We go back to the beginning. And I mean the very, very beginning with this. My first question for you is, what shows and movies were you watching when you were really young? And do you find that any of them have influenced the roles that you tend to gravitate towards now? Um, <laughs> dun -dun. I really loved Growing Pains. <laughs> I really loved the movie Annie. It's not very sophisticated stuff. Um, I really love The Facts of Life. Some solid choices right there. I really loved um, Different Strokes. I really loved All in the Family. I'm not I mean, seeing I'm many sitcoms on your resume now, though. No. So there you go. <laughs> what I will tell you is that my, you know, I had very, very young parents. They were 21 and 23 or 22, depending on, my dad doesn't always, I'm not quite sure how old my dad even is. Um, uh, and um, they, you know, they were young parents and my dad particularly liked watching scary movies. So we watched a lot of Friday the 13th movies, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, Psycho, all kinds of things that I think from a very young age imprinted me with um, a kind of terror that no young child should really honestly live with. So <laughs> it is sort of interesting that those were the movies that um, my dad liked to watch when, when we were with him. And uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty scary, scary over there. And yet here I find myself. Now that's a very clear connection that I could see. Yeah. So you came out of the womb wanting to act, but I know it's a completely different story saying, I want to be an actor versus I believe I can be an actor. So do you remember when that switch happened for you? Um, I remember sitting on the jungle gym at my school in Park Slope. I was in the sixth grade. Maybe I was about to be in the seventh grade. And I had a, a teacher named Robert Stallworth. Um, who was the acting teacher at this middle school I was going to. Um, and he said, you know, I don't know if you know this, but you can go to a high school. It's a specialized high school where you could take acting classes as part of your curriculum, you know, along with your English and your math classes. And I was like, I remember like swinging my feet and being like, what, what do you mean? And he said, well, you, I think you maybe, you know, when I was a kid, I'm sure I didn't know, why. you know, I knew nothing about anything. I still don't. I think a lot about acting is so mysterious. Um, but he just was the first person to introduce it to me as something that could be a profession um, and that I could study to learn more about it. And it didn't just have to be a pastime or something that I was casually interested in. It could, I think he could tell that I was more than casually interested in it. And, um, and so I auditioned for what is no known sort of formally now as LaGuardia High School, um, but it had been music and art and uh, and performing arts. Um, and it probably changed when I auditioned for that school and I was accepted. And it was such a, you know, I think 3000 kids auditioned for the drama department the year that I was entering and 60 kids are accepted. So it's a very, um, and I don't know how much of what those numbers, if, if they remain that way or not, but it was a very competitive, you know, and I had a lot of friends who were, you know, trying to get into Stuyvesant and, uh, you know, these other schools that were specialized schools. Um, and I got into to this, to this high school and it was the first moment where I thought, oh, I can actually pursue this as a profession. And it, it was probably the, the moment I went from being a person who only wanted to see plays and only go to the movies. And that was what my mother would do for me on my birthdays was she would take me to see a play. And I don't know that there were a ton of kids who wanted to do that at 11, 12, 13, 14, um, before I went even into that high school and knew that that was something. But that was what I was interested in was going to. 
So you go to that school and correct me if I'm wrong here, if my timelines are off, but I believe that after you graduated from there, you got work on screen and also on stage. Correct. So was there ever, did you always know that you wanted a balance at that point? Or no. was there ever anyone that encouraged you to focus on one or the other? No, I was a child, you know, I was, I was, I was unformed in a lot of ways and still am, uh, I hope, because that means there's possibility for continuing to, to change and shift, but I was, a, I didn't know what was possible. The idea of career, the idea of life outside my little bubble, you know, that teenagery, this is all there is bubble. Um, I couldn't really, I didn't know that there was such a thing as striking a balance. I just thought of an acting job in New York on Broadway, understudying Amy Ryan was my first job, along with an episode of Law and Order where my character was the main story for that that episode. And it's a rite of passage in New York, the original Law and Order. There's like a whole group of us. Um, you know, you can go back and see people, you know, that show's been on how many years now? I mean, you just, you can see all kinds of the beginnings of all kinds of careers. Um, you know, that was when I didn't know I could turn my head on camera. I think I've told this story before where I didn't know that I could, I thought I, I would move like I was in some kind of brace because I thought I didn't realize the camera could move with me. And, you know, it's not the kind of thing I learned at school. And I did not go to a conservatory after high school because I did start working, which was um, a surprise to me. And I think a real shock to my mother that I was actually going to pursue this. I was in love with him. I did what he told me. We cleaned up the blood. And Steve took mom away. It's the right pair of eyes watching you sort of can determine whether or not you have a successful career or not. What I mean by that is that on Law and Order, I went to audition for Lynn Kressel, who was casting all the things at that time in New York. And I went to audition for her for Law and Order. I got a call back. I went then to the producer session, which was down where Law and Order was shooting some other place. And I went in to, with Ed Sharon and I can't remember Constantine something. I can't remember his last name. He had been the DP, I think, or one of the ADs and he was directing this episode. And Ed Sharon is married to Jane Alexander. Uh, he is just this wonderful director, producer, but I did my audition. And in the audition, I was supposed to cry. It was like, because in this episode, I was going to have to cry a lot. And there is a something you can find for connectivity for the rest of my working life thus far. I'm dying to do a comedy. Um, I promise I'm kind, I can be funny. But um, I, <laughs> uh, I remember doing the audition and I did it. And I sort of looked up at him and I'm all of 19. And, uh, and he went, I think you're feeling something right now that if you allowed yourself to feel it would be exactly what you would need to do in the scene. Are you feeling embarrassed? Because I didn't cry at all, the whole, the whole scene. I couldn't cry because I was nervous or I didn't know. I, and I, he 100% knew that I felt humiliated and embarrassed. And he just said, do you feel that way? And I said, yes. And I started to cry. And he said, go read the scene now. And I did, and I got the part, but that is, that much like, you know, the Ryan Murphy stories of later, that's the difference between an actor who gets to work a lot and a person who doesn't. For whatever reason, Ed Sheeran took that extra moment with me, didn't let me leave the room and just said, who knows what, I mean, I, I could to this day could ask him what made him do that. Maybe it was total, you know, luck. Maybe there was something he saw that I don't, you know, but he's why I got that job, which then allowed me to, you know, continue to pursue the career because I was able to make a living and getting some communication that it was the right choice. And, you know, it's these little tiny moments where you just go, God, what would have happened to me if he hadn't done that? That, that makes me think about something that you brought up like a while back. I was talking to you about Carol and you made a comment about the nature of auditions now and not preferring a taped audition. Do, do you think that opportunities like that and interactions like that in the audition space are kind of, I don't know, are they at risk of evaporating because we are shifting so much towards tapes and Zoom auditions? Yes. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I And I, of course... Um, the last thing I auditioned for was the Goldfinch, um, 
which was the bomb heard around the world, but I don't care. I, I loved making it and it was my favorite book and uh, that I'd read in a while. And I wanted to work with all those actors and that director. And I had to fight really hard to get him to even see me. It's like the girl who played Marsha Clark can't play Xandra in this. I don't under, I can't. So my only reason of, of bringing that up is that I don't have a ton of experience in the last few years of the audition thing in terms of the value of it. I now have that thing and being in the executive producerial space sometimes where I get, you know, get to look at auditions and what ends up happening is instead of giving a note in a room to an actor and having a, uh, an opportunity to see what an actor does with the thing you've communicated to them, how do they use it? Because I guess Ed Sharon could have said to me, I think you're feeling humiliated. And I could have gone, no, I'm not. I could have, I could have hidden myself self-protectively and then I wouldn't have gotten but instead I was open to it and that's what he needed to see is like could I go there if asked do you know and so this is that thing where uh in these other auditions what they'll do is they'll give an actor a note after the tapes have all been watched by the producer and then they give them a note through their agent and then they retape with the note and I do think it it takes away some of the magic that can happen in a room. It just, there is something, there is alchemy, there is synergistic energy that happens in a room with, when you're reading with another actor, as opposed to a casting director who reads everything very flatly. Acting is about listening and responding. And you can imagine somebody listening and responding to you in a particular way, but it's much easier if you have a person really doing it. So, you know, um, yes, I think we are at risk of, of so many things because of technology and also we stand to gain so much from technology but exactly. but, the, but you know we are able to continue to do this kind of thing because of technology you know very true and i'm very grateful for that right now um going back to some of your early tv experience of all the series that you were a part of i mean american gothic jack and jill deadwood you name it which would you say taught you the most where you find yourself applying, you know, actionable lessons to the stuff that you're working on now? On Jack and Jill, I met my best friend, Amanda Pete, who has both my life and my working life been the person uh, I tend to go to the most for an assessment of what I'm doing or not doing. She's the person I'll go read something with before I decide what I'm going to do. She does the same with me. Our lens is exactly the same. So we tend to respond to the same music or book or poet, anything. Uh, and we also tend to reject the same kinds of things. So if she thinks what I'm doing is good, I tend to feel confident and can go forth into the night and vice versa. Um, and so that experience that was not necessarily the working experience, although I had that with her doing the show, but it was a very, um, it was a very formative, you know, I was 24. Um, and, you know, she's been my best friend ever since. And I rely on her totally for her, both her expertise and her um, insight uh, and her empathy and just her total human self to help me uh, assess things. And I think she, she relies on the same for me. And so that, that um, has been a big, huge, huge, huge part of the way I work and the choices I make also. I love, I love hearing about relationships like that. Uh, I usually save this for later in the show, but it feels like a good transition right now. One of my favorite Collateral Ladies Night questions to ask is a big one. Who is a film female filmmaker out there that you think is changing the industry for the better? Um, Ava DuVernay. I think she's an extraordinary, I mean, when they see us to me was beyond just the potency of the subject matter. It was what she did visually was this impossible um, straddling of insisting that you look at it and all, uh, uh, the beauty of the shot and also being completely, it, it completely dissolves and all you're doing is focusing on the story. It was such a, a bizarre uh, feat, I thought. Um, and just, I, I don't know. And I, I just am, am begging at her feet to find some opportunity to work with her. Um, I think she's, so special and and uh sort of refusing to be unseen you know oh, well, so. i absolutely love that i always think she is a wonderful answer to that question and not the first time i've heard that answer which i think speaks to just her presence and the influence that she has yeah. back to your filmography here <laughs> let's go with uh Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. I'm curious about your experience on that one because 
the hype on that was just through the roof. I think it broke records for like licensing fees and things like that. So what was your experience managing the expectations for being part of Aaron Sorkin's first big show after West Wing? Uh, what I can say is that uh, that was my first, I mean, I had done Jack and Jill. I had done, God, had I done Deadwood? No? Possibly. If I have the list right in my head, possibly. I think it's possible. I don't remember. This is a tr real tragedy for me more than you because it's my actual life. It's because but, you've done so many great things. You um, can't keep them all straight. It makes but, sense. But I remember, you know, I had done Glass Menagerie in New York with Jessica Lange. We had done it on Broadway. It was not well received. But of course, my relationship with Jessica Lange is such a through line through, you know, it's, it's sort of why I'm sitting here talking to you today. And that's the actual truth. Um, but uh, I wasn't getting any work. And I knew also the other thing is on Studio 60, this happened, this has happened to me. It happened to me on Game Change and it happened to me on Studio 60. I got these jobs because of the wives of the men directing them because they were watching all the tapes and it was their wives who were like, you, are you, you have to, it has to, it's that one, that one. And they were like, really? I wasn't sure. I was thinking maybe the other one, you know, it's gotten down to me and another girl on both of those projects and both Jay Roach's wife and Tommy Shlomi's wife were like the Sarah girl. And I just think that is, I'm not saying that they were anti me, the men, but they were conflicted. And the women in their lives were like, there is not a, there's not a conversation to be had here. This is what you have got to do. And uh, I always thought that was sort of interesting. These two big sort of seminal moments for me that getting Studio 60 was a big deal. There were, a, it was the the hottest thing in town. And as you said, the licensing fees alone, and he's coming off of the wild success of the West Wing, Matthew Perry coming off friends has just ended and it's his first. Um, it was a really, really, really big deal. And a lot of actresses wanted this part. And I was coming off, as I said, a time of really not working. So I just didn't. And it was Amanda who insisted that they see me because um, Amanda was also already cast. Um, and I had originally gone, I think I'd actually gone in for her part before, while well, she was still being, and they said, per Amanda's suggestion, will you come in for Harriet Hayes? And I don't think I was high on the list. I, I think ultimately what happened is, I, as I was told at the at my final audition, I was told you had to come with characters prepared, like skits in character. So I brought my bobby pins to do my Juliet Lewis impression. I brought my thing to do my this impression. I And I did them. Whereas I think the other girl that it came down to uh, to us did not do that. So I think maybe I had that added element. But I, from what I've understood, and who knows if it's been embellished or member, memory is a funny thing, um, but I was told that it was Christine Lottie who, who was saying to Tommy, like, this is so I did, in terms of managing my expectation, it was a hard fought job to get. And then, you know, I remember being in my trailer thinking like, oh, so I should probably buy a house because I'm probably going to be in LA for a while. I'd just been in New York and I was like, I'm probably going to have to stay here. This thing's going to run for six or seven years. And, you know, so it was definitely, and I think we all thought that there were too many, you know, too many of the moving parts were all these anointed, celebrated. But look, at the end of the day, I got to, I got to, I got to do Aaron Sorkin speak. I got to, I got to have his dialogue, like live in my mouth and come out of it. Like it just, it's, it's, that's something that nobody can take away no matter what, you know. And eventually you did get your epic run with a show on American Horror Story, which is one of my absolute favorite shows in existence. It just speaks to all my sensibilities. And I love how you guys just go for it every single time. From my perspective, that felt like a game changer. Did it feel like that for you as well? Yes, it was a, again, I was in a pocket of time where I had not been working and it was, then something happened and I got Martha Marcy, May Marlene, Game Change and American Horror Story, 12 Years a Slave, all of the same oh, yes. nothing was coming my way. And then all of a sudden it just sort of, I did Martha Marcy, I went to Sundance, that movie got a lot of attention, obviously it was, you know, Sean Durkin is, I can't wait to see The Nest. I'm already just like, I mean, are you not it's upset? good. We had Carrie Coon on the show for The Nest and she's wonderful and she's so good in it. Oh, I mean, I just cannot wait. I, I love her and I love Sean Durkin. I think he is. And the fact that we've had to wait this long for another movie since Martha Marcy, it's like, dude, come on, I need this now. Um, but yeah, and I just, uh, I remember I came back, I did a pilot that didn't get picked up. I got Game Change. I left to go do Game Change. I got... Uh, American Horror Story because of Jessica Lange and then 12 Years a Slave and that all happened at the same time and then subsequently they were all coming out at the same time and I got nominated for Game Change and then nominated for American Horror Story the following year and then it just sort of 
has never really. Hey, oh, oh <gasps> who is that? Are you barking and you want to play? Oh my goodness. This, <gasps> this is a very animal friendly show. Would you like to come see Perry? <gasps> Perry? Oh my. Winnie? What is, what is his or her name? This is Winnie. Oh, Winnie, you are beautiful. Are you the prettiest little dog? Oh, I can match this. Oh. Oh. Winnie, Who meet Deputy it? Dewey. Winnie, it's a cat. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Winnie, it's a cat. <gasps> <laughs> He's like so unhappy right now. This is CAT, she runs up. No, it's not outside, it was on the... <laughs> Poor dog is like... And I just disturbed Dewey from his loaf, but I it was worth it. Sorry, Dewey. <laughs> And all right I, um i can't remember what the hell i was saying we were talking about american horror oh, yeah. story yeah and it, it absolutely changed my life there's no question about it no. i i love that actually kind of to follow up on that a little bit when you think about it do you credit the popularity of american horror story with changing everything or your collaboration with ryan murphy because what you two went on to do together i just like i still can't wrap my mind around it yeah, it's a very unique collaboration. It's hard for me to separate the chicken and egg of popularity mixed with my my relationship with Ryan or Ryan's trust in me or whatever. The, I mean, I still to this day don't understand why he was like, oh, I'll let you play Lana Winters. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know if he <laughs> It's just like, wait, what? I had like three scenes the first season. Now you're going to, what? You're going to give me that part? Okay. Um, it was It was really an extraordinary uh, communication of his trust in me. And that was something that I think ultimately was something that was sort of lacking in my in my working experience was that feeling of a feeling really seen in somebody really saying I know you can do this and so I'm saying you're doing it and now you've just got to do it and he just continues to do this to me time and time and time and time and time and time and time again and I am exceedingly grateful for it but it's terrifying every time I mean I'm about to I'm three days into Linda Tripp and it's um really scary it sounds like a scary that's probably worth it, though, especially given your track record together. Well, I mean, I think the scripts are very special. I really do. Um, I really do. Uh, and it's a huge stretch for me as an actor. And that is thrilling, thrilling to me. And to find myself at 45, almost 46 years old, being, give, being given a part that like, you know, in terms of the complexity and, you know, there is nothing about this woman that is, um, uh, what's the right word? She's, she's, she's complicated. And it's not like a Marsha Clark situation where you ultimately have to confront your feeling of how wrong we were, you know? Not that you won't feel some of that for Linda when you have a little bit of a, a context for what, what was her life was. But again, we don't have to talk about that. I was just thinking about, anyway, sorry. <laughs> I am, I'm very much looking Sorry. forward to that. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I have, a, I have another like big broad question for you because I will never forget being on the set of Ron and getting to watch you work and just to see how kind of like in tune you were with every single element of the production. And also you've directed a great episode of American Horror Story. So at what point in your acting career did you realize that you had not only just like an interest, but a knack for all elements of production? Uh, I think what you're actually describing is a person who's a real bossy boots and who has a real, <laughs> has a real, I mean, ask anybody in my life who's, who, to, you know, to whom I'm very close. I am um, very opinionated and I have lots of ideas about how you should do what you're doing. Um, and it's something I'm working on. So I think that sort of uh, lent itself to this idea. Look, when it comes to the directing thing, being on American Horror Story, this is something that Evan Peters and I have talked about before where, We've been there from the beginning and obviously he in a, in a much more significant way in that first season than I was, but essentially it's been the two of us um, consistently for the bulk of the, the series, save for the last, the most recent one um, that we're both coming back for, for next year. But you get so well-versed in the machine of it. With American Horror Story, we're always arguably trying to meet air dates. By the time we start shooting and the scripts and the air dates, we are always shooting the hours on that show. I have friends who are like, who, all of whom are actors who are like, what, 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 why, why, why are you at work at six in the morning? You got there at five. The, well, well, it's too it's too much. What's 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 the deal? And it's like, I think we're always trying to meet air dates where the scripts are incredibly ambitious. We're trying to give them everybody everything they want. And and I think at the end of the day, like 
nobody is more expert about the world than the people who are there helping to make happen from the crew to the actors to everybody. So it was an easy jump for me on that, in that world to go to, to that position because it was a crew I'd worked with for so many years. Uh, it's a genre. I think I understand now having been part of it for so long. Um, but I had a lot of help. I had so much support, you know, Ryan even came and sat behind me on the monitor on my second day of shooting and, was just very moving to me that he did that. And he had told me that I was not going to have any special effects. He's like, it's just going to be the episode I'm going to have you do. It's an episode where it's just, Jessica's going to come back. I was supposed to do episode eight. And then he's like, I want you to do episode six because it's a return to murder house. It'll be all the things, just a bunch of actors sitting around talking. That's going to be great for you. And I was like, okay, cut to my second day of shooting. I had to have Dylan thrown across the wall, thrown across the room, hitting the wall. Somebody uh, disintegrates and turns and evaporates into fire. There's a stabbing and he came to work on that day. And he's like, oh, oops. I don't think, <laughs> I was like, Ryan, <laughs> like this is so crazy. You told me it was just going to be me and Jessica. What's happened? I don't, this is, ah. But that's just like him. You know, he, he throws at you just a little bit more than you can, than you can chew. I love that. Kind of leaning into run a little here with that one, because we're also talking on set about how it was a unique experience for you to work with Sev, Natalie, and Anish at a, as a team. So when you're in a situation like that and you're experiencing something new, when do you kind of figure out the divide between this is something new and exciting and I should adapt to this new process versus this doesn't feel right to me and I need to speak up now. Um, it's always here, you know, <laughs> so Anish told me from the jump that he works with them with seven that, and that sometimes I'll see them conferring behind the monitor and they're all sort of weighing in. And he said, he may come up and give me a note that was one of their notes and that that is what, so none of it was a surprise to me, but it absolutely was an un, I think sort of unorthodox way of working, not, not in a, in a way that's, uh, I don't mean it pejoratively. I'm just saying I had never, I know there are people who co-direct, but I'd never seen a director work with two producers First, it was unnerving for me. It was because it was like, I, I want to answer to one person. You know, I don't want to feel like directing by committee feels a little uncomfortable for me. But, you know, I thought I'm here. I loved that. I loved um, Anisha's first movie. I really did. I thought it was so inventive and smart and nail bitey and emotional. And I thought, how did he do that without ever doing anything in his traditional way and and sort of challenging the way we watched a movie and I was watching the whole movie like trying to be like put the camera on the you know which kind of was a, a really interactive experience which I loved you know so I thought this works for them and the end product was something that really resonated with me so I can't resist it I've said yes I knew this is what it was going to be so go with it and the minute I allowed that to happen I ended up having a really wonderful time uh, with that component of it and the, the main thing with, with, with Anish that was so wonderful and with Kira as well is that I was working with two people who were just relatively new to, you know, Anish had made a movie, but Kira had never been a lead. She's the lead of, she's the lead of Run, you know, that she's is so she, good. And she is so good. And I keep saying this to her and I don't know if she believes me or not, but I just would marvel at her on the set because I kept thinking I would no more have the comportment. I would no more at that age carrying the weight of this of a you know at that time it was just a Lionsgate release it was a studio movie like how in the world is she managing this so well and going to these places emotional places and you know it just it was it was a real feat and I thought it was so impressive and I thought it was equally impressive that Anish fought the battle that he did to have Kira play the part and then he didn't want, you know, one of the, you know, newly anointed, freshly minted new things on the scene. He wanted an actress and he, uh, that had not been seen before. He wanted authenticity in terms of uh, a wheelchair user. Uh, he wanted it to be as real as possible. And, and I thought that was bold and that was uh, brave. And that was a person who was always gonna come to me with every single thing he wanted, needed or thought should be happening with real thought and consideration and care. And a person who was not afraid to swing big. And I thought, I just wanna, I wanna work with people like that. And, and you know, I get to say I was there when Kira Allen became Kira Allen, you know? 
I think one of the greatest joys of finally getting to see the movie when it was finished was the fact that she just blew me away. She really is something else. Really something else. And she, I'm sure you you spoke to her a little bit too. Um, she's a really, really special, sensitive and so smart. And, you know, she's just, she has wonderful parents and she's a wonderful young woman. And I, I know that we are just, we are just getting the first little bits of, of Kira. I fully believe that as well. Yeah, I do. Going, yeah. going back to working with a niche, because yeah. I know for this movie, he was channeling Hitchcock and also M. Night Shyamalan. So I'm curious what it was like for you to have gone from working with M. Night to the set of Run, where someone's trying to channel the M. Night uh, style. Funny, because I was actually leaving to go do press for Glass on one weekend that they had given me off to go do that. I left Winnipeg to fly to New York to do the press. I was going to see Knight and, you know, Anish was just so cute because he gets a little nerdy around the around the um, night stuff where he's just like, so, um, so what are you going to, what are, are you, what kind of press are you doing? What are you doing? And so you, how, you're going to be with him. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, this shot that I actually did is actually an homage to Bob. And I'm, it just, he was so... Um, respectful and I for me I have to say like I love a fan I love a fan who's also a creative person you know who's a creator and who's self-generating all this stuff who has no problem um celebrating the the miracle work of the people that have come before him you know and and um I don't know. I just love that. And partly because when I see an actor that I've admired my whole life and I'm in a room with them I don't know how to be like hey what's up <laughs> No, it's very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you too. I'm like, hi, I'm Sarah and I love you so much. Like, I don't know how to not do it. Um, so I really, I really uh, bonded with Anish over his love for, for Knight. And, I, you know, I have so much love for Knight. Um, I really, he taught me a lot about myself. He's a really soulful man. Um, I really hope to work with him again. Um, I would like another shot at uh, not being so panicked. <laughs> I was really panicked when I was working with because it was, you know, it's a it's a real thing to come into a, an environment that is where there's well established connection between both Bruce and Sam Samuel Samuel L Jackson uh, and 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 um, James McAvoy like there was and and Anna um, it it's it's a real it's a real thing um, and so I was nervous I was nervous 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 and didn't want to disappoint him and so I would like an opportunity to try it again and and now that I know him not be so panicked I would love to see that happen as we wind down here I do have one spoiler question for you on run so I'm going to put up the spoiler flag right now for anyone who hasn't seen the movie so my question is do you think that this selfishness that Diane has was specifically sparked by her losing her biological child or if that baby had been okay, do you think that Diane still would have had some of the traits that we see on display in Run? 100%. Diane was a victim of terrible abuse and neglect by her own mother. And I think in a somewhat twisted, but initially valiant, and probably somewhat pure effort to do the very thing that was never done for her, which was to give the utmost care and attention to her child. And she just took it to a place where something else took over. And it, it's, it may have accelerated. Um, and certainly her needing to get as far away from, uh, her needing to live in some kind of seclusion and all the secrecy, that is connected to having taken them taken a child that was not hers biologically but what she did to chloe i think she would have done if the yep. child had been hers that that was what i was thinking okay well good we always, uh, <laughs> we always end lady night ladies night with some uh, random questions just okay. questions that i think of on the spot so i will give okay. you if you could learn more about one job on a film set what would it be and why uh, uh um probably the, the lens, the kid, the, so I know a little bit about the, um, you know, if you say you're on a 50, you say you're on a whatever, but I would like to learn more about, um, about what it means. And also <laughs> here's what I would like to learn. I would like to understand how a script supervisor does what they do. It is literally, I look at them and the, the notes and the margins and the rulers and the things, and I'm a person who I really like my stuff all. So I would like to know, because I'm also, I have a little bit of a dyslexia. Like when I look at the camera, I'm like, 
So it's on her left. Is that her left? Is that my right? Is that my, you know, so I would like to um, get a little bit of a lay of the land of how they do all that whilst also thinking about anything else that they're thinking about. It's an unsung hero of a film crew right unsung there. Hero of a film crew. And also I would like to apologize for all, you know, on behalf of all actors everywhere to every supervisor when they're told they did something with one hand and the actor insists they did it with the other hand and the script supervisor is like, I'm telling you, and you argue very, very valiantly that you did not do that. And then they show you the frame and then you go, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, that, that's just poor script supervisors everywhere have to deal with this. How about... What is the weirdest thing you've ever had to learn for a role? The weirdest thing I've ever had to learn for a role. Oh, I'm sure it was, um, it's not so weird, but it was the um, in Coven when we all had to learn the spell. That was something that like we all kept laughing. Also, everyone, the like voice memo that they sent for us to learn the Latin was this woman was speaking and we still make a joke about it now. Those of us who were there where the woman who taped it would do the Latin in different speeds. And then at that very end, she'd be like, and slower now. And then she would do it very slowly so that we could pick up every little consonant. And so now sometimes we just all look at each other and go, slower now. It's really fun. That was a weird thing to learn where we were all like at night going, wait, how do you pronounce this? And what is this? And, and then you work with Franny Conroy, who just knows what the Latin is already. Of course. <laughs> My last one for you. I always end on this one. I like it. It's a deep question. You can either go light with it or deep. Your preference is totally fine here. What is the biggest fear that you've ever had that you've actually managed to overcome? Biggest fear. What if I haven't overcome any of them? I kind of don't believe that's true. Well, or at least maybe not fully, but I'd like to bet you've made progress on something. I don't think you're right. I haven't made progress on it. I have a terrible fear of public speaking. I hate to speak in public. It makes me so nervous. I get my heart starts raising, my palms are sweating. I hate it, 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 I hate it. But I have had to do it. Um, so I, I wouldn't say I've overcome it, but I've been forced to do it and have done it. Anytime I've seen you do it, you've done it well. And I will also add that I've seen what you've been doing. I mean, maybe not public speaking in the traditional sense, but on your Instagram mm -hmm. with your fans and your followers, and you are just giving them exactly what they want in the moment. And I appreciate you taking the time to do things like that because it's so the the community is important right now. Yeah, I feel like we're all just sort of so isolated and it's just, I don't know, they're, they're the reason that people keep asking me to show up on a set. It's because they're interested in seeing me do something and that has to be celebrated and accounted for. Seeing some of those videos just like make my heart want to burst. I have to let you go. I'm going to get kicked out of this room. So thank you for your time today. And for everybody out there, run on Hulu, November 20th. Seriously, really do not miss it. See you guys soon with more Ladies Night. Bye.